Welcome to the Business of Design podcast. I'm Cheryl Horn, Director of Operations for Business of Design. A lot has changed at Business of Design since this episode originally aired. For the latest information and rates on events and membership at Business of Design, head to businessofdesign.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, hello. Welcome to Business of Design, episode 180. The sun is shining, it's summertime, and you know what we're doing at Business of Design? We are going to take a week off. It seems strange, doesn't it, to think about taking a week off when so much of the regular things we do have been off for months, but we recognize that we've been busy building new initiatives and new programs we're launching very soon, and we've been working so hard. So Cheryl suggested we all power down for a week, which we're going to do. I don't want to leave you without an episode, so I have chosen a repeat, one of my absolute favorites. This is my go-to guru when it comes to marketing, someone I trust who has a track record to prove he's taken many companies from obscurity to fame, from low profit to high profit, and when the going gets tough, this is the guy they call. If you've never heard the two episodes with Bruce Philp, now is your chance to learn from a master. This will be a repeat of episode 23, You Are a Brand, Whether You Like It or Not, part one. When you listen to this podcast and you want more Bruce Philp, you'll be in luck because you can go to episode 28 at businessofdesign.com and listen to episode 28. Actually, you can listen to the episode anywhere you subscribe for podcasts. If you appreciate the service we provide to the community, we would love for you to take a moment and give us a shout out online, rate us in your favorite podcast app, and tell a friend. Wherever you are, we hope you and your family, your loved ones, and your friends are healthy and safe and keeping your eye on the horizon. Good things ahead, including this awesome episode. Thank you so much for your continued support. Everyone at Team BOD thanks you. Enjoy the show. Just a couple of announcements before we jump into this week's episode. If you're a monthly or annual member of Business of Design, we have our monthly group coaching coming up this week. So on July 22nd, 1 o'clock p.m. EST, registrations open on the website, so I hope you can join us there. As well, Business of Design has partnered with IMC to bring you some virtual learning as part of the upcoming High Point in Las Vegas markets. All the details are on our website. We've partnered for three webinars and registration is opened. So head to businessofdesign.com. Thanks and enjoy the show. You are a brand, whether you like it or not. And this is part one. I say it's one of my favorites because the guest, oh my gosh, brilliant guy, brand strategist, Bruce Philp. Every single time I talk to this man, he challenges me to better thinking and better understanding. And I think you're going to find the same thing. And then the topic, you're a brand, whether you like it or not. The topic arose because of a question that I asked Bruce in the interview, which is, is it possible to have a brand and be totally unaware of what your brand is, or even to be working at cross purposes against your own brand? And the answer, well, you're going to hear it from him. Now, some of you might be like me and you're thinking, uh, at least when I first started, I'm just little on me. I have this small firm. Yeah, I know I need a logo. I need a website. I need a business card. But that's really all the thought I need to give to a brand. And one of the things that helped turn my thinking around on the subject was actually a book that I read. And that's why you're going to meet Bruce, because he's the author of the book. It's called Consumer Republic. And in the book, he goes to bat for the fact that consumers gain power by companies having brands, that it's actually really good for us that companies have brands because it shows that they have skin in the game. They have their eye on the long run. They're going to be around for a long time, et cetera. Of course, he's going to explain it much better. But suffice it to say, you owe it to yourself to lead with a brand if you plan to win over clients, if you want to instill confidence in those clients, if you want those clients to hire you, if you want to earn more money, this is all going to become really important. And this was mind-blowing for me. I never heard it put quite this way. But Bruce said, people don't buy our product, right? We don't make widgets. They buy the belief 
that we can create and deliver a product. And did you hear that? That was like an atomic explosion in my brain. I never was able to kind of put that in context. That is so true. I'm not selling a thing. I'm selling a belief. And so a a good brand is going to help me deliver that message to my customers. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, participate in monthly coaching calls, and find unlimited support within our exclusive members-only Facebook group. Unlike traditional coaching, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $79. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Let me tell you about Bruce now. He's a 30-year veteran of branded marketing and an award-winning author and a teacher of how it works and why it matters. He is a self-described optimist with experience. I love that. His company, Heuristic, was founded in 2011 following the publication of his second book, which he won a bunch of awards for, Consumer Republic. There's a link to the book on our website. Definitely check that out. Heuristic is a boutique consultancy that helps new and transitioning brands find profit and purpose. This straight from their website. Experience has shown us that when brands are true to themselves, businesses are more resilient. Products are more valuable. People find their work more meaningful. Customers become advocates. And we think if enough brands operated this way, brandy could even make the world a better place. Heuristic is a widely known and celebrated firm in a lot of big corporate uh, companies. It was hard to get an answer from Bruce when I asked him what products he was working on at the moment, Uh, but I went on the website, did a little sleuthing, and I can see that they've worked with ING, Capital One, Kobo, Uber recently. Again, I guess they've got an ongoing relationship there. I bet that's kept them busy. The Iron Workers of Canada, and I bring that one up because I happened to see a video that made me want to go and become an iron worker. It was so beautiful, and I know they did that. Wind Mobile is another one. And I picked out Sapsucker because I happen to think that's one of the most beautiful logos I've ever seen. And then Business of Design. You know, when I approached them, I thought, my company's way too little. They're never going to work with me. And I found the experience of working with them so beautiful, so moving, and ultimately so helpful. So it would be wrong if I didn't mention them. Bruce Philp, it is so nice to talk to you this way. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to do this. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Now, I promised you I wouldn't just ask you the bold blanket question, tell me all the things, right? (laughs) That's right. That was our deal. Okay. But there's a lot to talk about. And I know myself as a small business owner when I started out, when people told me I needed to think about my brand, I thought they were ridiculous. Why do I need to think about my brand if I'm a small interior design firm? Well, the, the list of reasons is pretty long. Um, I think at the top of that list is that you owe it to your clients to give them the confidence to hire you. Um, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, um, we 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 sell our services, you do and I do, um, long before the work is actually complete. So people don't actually buy our product. They buy the their belief that we're going to create that product. So if we present ourselves to them with confidence and with certainty and with um, you know kind of a clear sense of what we stand for and and uh, you know we appear to have that sort of swagger of professionalism, they're going to feel much more comfortable about um, about sort of signing us up and and then after that, I mean I hate to sound crass, but it actually goes to the question of profitability. You can simply confidently charge more money uh, for what you do if you look the part. I like when you're crass. Can we be crass through this entire podcast? Yeah, I'm cool with that. (laughs) Okay. Because I think it's something that most of us don't embrace enough, this idea that it's okay to be profitable. And then that being profitable starts far earlier with, uh, I love how you put it, creating a confident 
package that the client will buy into. Yeah, that's right. Because as I said, you know, at the end of the day, they don't really know what you're going to do. They're, they're hiring you on faith, just as they hire me on faith. How does your business intersect with our business? Well, I think there are obviously some big differences. The work that you do is much more personal to your clients than the work that we do is. Um, and I think that, uh, on the other hand, you know, for us, the, the budgets are often quite a bit larger, obviously, and the stakes, at least at a corporate level, um, also larger. So, you know, there are those differences. But, but what I think we share is that people hire us in the hope that we're going to magically solve a problem they can't solve themselves. And they hire us uh, hoping that we'll do that based on, you know, the, the signals we send to them that we've done it before. So my playing small is not being humble, right? I mean, I just can't chalk it up to that. I'm, I'm playing small because I don't want to act like a big shot because I'm just little old me decorating firm. No, not at all. You're not doing anybody any favors uh, that way. I mean, your, your objective is to, is to be paid as much as you reasonably can for what you've done and have the client go away happy at the end of it, right? So a happy client and you underpaid, that's a failure. Um, you being well paid, but the client going away miserable, that's a failure. Um, but in order to have that at bat, you have to convince them that you're someone who's done this kind of work before and you are comfortable with whatever exigencies might arise and you know how to handle them and it's all uh, you know pretty for you you want to have that kind of you know, this is sort of a macho reference point I suppose but you want to, you want to have that kind of fighter pilot certainty about you Wow I think I went about this the entire wrong way and maybe I backed into it but the fact of the matter is I thought I had to tell them with my words that I was going to take care of them and they were in good hands but what you're actually telling me is every component of a brand, is projecting that message to the client better than I can. Yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, you do have to reassure them that you're going to take care of them. It would be, you know, weird if you didn't say those things. But, you know, just as we do in relationships and just as we do when we're evaluating products that we might buy, we pay a certain amount of attention to what's directly said to us, but we pay a ton of attention to the in, indirect signals, the unintentional cues that, um, that we send that, that we think really hold the truth. So, okay. So there's two avenues now that I see in front of me. One is what do I, what are the components I need in my brand? And how am I going to get them today <laughs> or as soon as possible? Right. And then the second one is what you just said. What are these uh, the sub sig the signals. subconscious signals I'm giving out that I need to stop right now? And right. how do I replace them with better swagger? Right. Right. So, um, so I'll start with what are the components that you have to think about um, before we, we talk about the signals. And I guess generally speaking, I mean, when we're working with a corporate brand, we think of three basic conditions that have to be met before uh, a company can say that it has a brand. And I think those conditions more or less apply to an individual. I think they certainly apply to me when I'm working with clients, and I bet that they would to you and your listeners too. And they are these. So first is um, some kind of sense of purpose. Um, what If we don't believe that the people we're talking to, whether it's a carpenter, an electrician, or a landscaper, or a, a branding consultant, or a doctor, or a dentist, if we don't believe that those people are motivated by some higher purpose, then we assume that they are going to be opportunistic. It, it's going to be one or the other. So we, we want someone to walk through the door. Um, and, and give us the sense that they're internally motivated to make the world better in some way. That sounds corny, but, um, you know, but I think uh, we can make the world better uh, all sorts of ways, and those ways include great brands and great interior design. So the first is a sense of purpose. Um, they they, they want to, I think they want to know that you stand for something. The second is what we call in the business positioning, and what positioning really means is that you know who your customer is and what it is you offer them, and they know who to compare you to. And this is a thing that um, uh, individual professionals have trouble with, and uh, and even lots of young businesses have trouble with. They hate this idea of commitment. It's like I don't want to, I don't want to say I only do this kind of work because what if that kind of work comes along and I want, I want, yeah, I can do that too. And why would I want to leave money on the table? And the, the the hard lesson that it sometimes takes years or decades to learn is that. If you won't commit 
to a certain kind of customer and a certain kind of product uh, that you're the best at, then you will always be second place in every single competitive bid you ever make. And that doesn't, I think it doesn't matter whether, you know, you're an ad agency or an architect or, you know, really anybody. So you have to have an idea in your head of what it is you're the best at and who you're the best for. And it doesn't mean that in the cut and thrust of, you know, day-to-day business, you can't compromise because there are are other reasons that uh, make sense for you to do that. But but you should always bear in your mind um, that you are for a certain kind of customer and that you're the best at something. And then the third thing, the third component that we say a brand has to have is what we call character. Um, and that's kind of a nerdy strategy word. It really embodies two things. One is, do you have personality? Um, nobody trusts anybody with no personality. I, mean, I don't want to mention any politicians by name, but I'm sure we can think of personality-less politicians that we think are sketchy, <laughs> you know, just to kind of, you know, get political. But um, so so you got, you should have a personality and you should not be afraid to share that personality. Um, I'm actually not great at that. My partner is terrific at it. Um, it is a real, it's a really essential ingredient to getting people to open up to everything else you have to say. And the other piece of character is this idea of values. You have to, you just have to believe in certain things. You have to be the kind of person who has a code that they live by. And it almost doesn't matter what that code is. People are just reassured to know that you are principled. And, um, so if you have those kind of three things in place, if you, <clears throat> pardon me, um, if you, if you leave people with a sense that you have a, a purpose in life, if you are pretty clear in your mind about who you're for and what you're the best at. And if you're willing to kind of share your beliefs and your personality and the way that you go about doing your business, then you have a brand, whether you're a a person or a billion dollar corporation. Now, do you have a brand whether or not you know you have a brand? I mean, is it possible that people have a brand and they're completely unaware of what their brand is? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so good question. Not not only possible, but certain. The, the One of the hardest things to convince companies of, never mind individuals, is that you're going to get a brand whether you want it or not. The choice you're making is whether you're going to give yourself that brand or whether you're going to let the world do it for you. But there is no third option where you don't have one. Wow. Okay. Purpose, my purpose. Is it sufficient for me as the interior design firm, small or large? Is it sufficient for my purpose to be, I do great decorating? <laughs> um, I would say no, okay. uh, not quite, because you, you know that that is the price of admission to your business, right? You 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 have to even if you're not a great day, you have to believe that you are at least, and and hopefully be one. Um, you don't get to eat if you don't have that quality. The the kind of purpose I'm talking about is at a level above that. So it's about what drives me to even approach this business in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So I want to create lasting home environments that support uh, people's ability to be happy in their homes. Yeah, yeah, for example. Okay. And then the second one was, again... Sorry, my memory. So positioning, yeah. So I'm okay, positioning. Getting kind of jargony there. Sorry, but 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 so positioning essentially asks you to commit to what is that thing you're the best at, and who is the kind of customer for whom you are perfect. Now, do you t- do you accept that on default? In other words, I was speaking to another interior designer recently, Jackie Glass, and both of us had the experience where we were published in a magazine early in our career. And that became our customer for a long time. And it was hard to shake that customer um, because we got a lot of publicity. So in my case, it was a French country look. And it stuck with me long after that trend was popular. Yeah. So is it about a style or is it about a certain snack bracket? I want to deal with uh, mid to high end clients. How defined do I need to get that? Yeah, I think you 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 want to in your own mind be pretty defined. You may you may want to be more careful about the language you use when you're talking about it publicly. But the problem that you describe is a problem that that corporations have too. I mean, we might think about you know Nike in the early '90s making nothing but athletic shoes, you know, gazing longingly at the leisure wear market. Um, and, you know, positioning like any kind of strategic decision comes with a cost. And But the thing you have to kind of remember is that every every decision comes at a cost and a risk. They all do. There is no way to make a decision about your business and about your brand that doesn't um, carry along with it uh, some risk or some some freight. So what what you what you want to be able to do is is position yourself so that you can build bridges from that in the future. Um, it's not a question of saying no to every 
piece of business that comes along that doesn't conform. And it isn't a question of doing, you know, French country for the rest of your life. But it is a question of knowing why you were great at that and, and, and thinking about what those act, how those attributes could be exported to another look, another context, another situation. All you don't want to do is stand for nothing and no one. Okay. So let's just say I'm just starting out and I'm, I'm desperate, right? I want, I want work at any cost. Mm. Is this something I need to think about that early or is this something I think about 10 years in? You know, it's the first thing I would think about. I mean, when we work with, um, with small businesses, like uh, and I'm thinking now about startups in particular, one of the principal reasons they fail is their unwillingness to consider the three questions that 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 I've talked about here, um, in the belief that that they that they'll leave themselves more flexible and they'll be able to go out and find the business wherever it lies. I firmly believe that even if you have to do work that isn't consistent with your ambition in order to keep the lights on, you should still have that thing stuck on the wall. Here is my purpose. Here here is what I'm the best at and here's who I'm for. And if you compromise that in order to pay the bills, then then just get up in the morning and look at that thing and say, okay, not today, but maybe tomorrow. But you cannot have nothing pinned to the wall. Okay. It almost sounds like you could boil those three things down into a mission statement and just have it as your mantra. Yeah, you, you, you could. And I think that I think that's a great exercise to go through and much harder than people think it's going to be. The trick is that you have to you have to be your your own toughest client because mission statements and this applies to the corporate world too are are so easy to kind of take all the edges off so that they're completely beige and meaningless and uncontentious and and uh, that's a mistake. You want it to be a little bit tough. Uh, you want it to be a little bit hard to to live with because that's how you'll get better. Okay. This is really fascinating. Okay. And then the third part of the equation was personality and character. Yeah. Tell me about that. How do you project that except for when you meet the client? Well, I think the personality piece is easy. If you're in a creative industry, you're, you have a personality. The question is simply whether you've been letting it off the leash or not. Um, and and I, I just think that we have more permission to do that than we think we do. Um, I, it, it took me a long time in my career to get comfortable with being the arrogant jerk I actually am with clients, <laughs> but they're, they like, they're reassured by that. And every once in a while, there'll be one that I don't get along with, but, 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 but frankly, if they, if they aren't comfortable taking my advice, then I can't give them any value anyway. So it's better that we don't work together, but everybody else wants me to be authentic. They're comforted by the fact that I'm authentic because it says I'm confident. <clears throat> and if I'm confident, it says that I've generally been more right than I've been wrong in my career. And that's the kind of guy they want in their corner. How do we, oh man, I, I hear exactly what you're saying and I agree with you a hundred percent and I feel like I'm there, but there's so many people listening who are saying, oh my gosh, I am, I just don't have that kind of confidence yet. What, what am I going to do? I guess this is taking us right down that second path I, you identified, which is how do you project your swagger? Oh, signals, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, I, <clears throat> the story that I like to tell about this particular subject has to do with our own business. Um, and the story is called the thousand dollar business card. So, um, my partner is also my wife and we work together out of our home. Um, so we have clients all over the world and they're all corporate clients and they're, they're all pretty big and, and it looks very impressive on our website. But the fact is that on most days it's the two of us and the cat in our pajamas kind of working. Um, and, so that produces a certain dissonance that you have to deal with where you, when you're on the phone, <clears throat> you know, you, you have to give people the, the sort of confidence that they're dealing with a professional who's experienced and, and, you know, as I said earlier, is right more often than they're wrong. But on the other hand, you want to enjoy the benefits of being, you know, uh, of being self-employed and, and, uh, and the kind of casual ease that goes with that. And, you know, the fact is I'm never not thinking about my client's problems, even if I'm cutting the lawn. So when we first started working together, my wife and partner said, um, we need awesome business cards. And I'm like, so not digital ones then, like just from a printer. No, no, really awesome business cards. So I'm like, oh, so like they're thicker and they have that bumpy type on them. And she's like, no, no, really awesome business cards. So the next thing you know, we have these beautiful uh, letterpress, you know, sort of maker culture kind of, you know, slabs of high cotton fiber, you know, cardboard with this beautiful, you know, kind of letterpress, you know, you know, debossed images and like lovely kind of early 20th century 
feeling to them and they're printed on both sides and and uh and you you hand them to somebody and they they feel uh you know kind of guilty if they don't look at them for a minute and and it cost like a thousand dollars a box and um <clears throat> and so i said well okay um we, we'll trust each other this is what we'll do and so we bought these expensive business cards. And the two things I will tell you are, A, I still have lots, so it really <laughs> wasn't bad value. And B, um, when I hand one of those things to somebody, they always raise an eyebrow and they remember it and they don't throw it out. And and it looks like a, com- a card that comes from a company that is successful and prosperous and cool and and considers every detail, which is exactly what they hope they're hiring. So... Yeah. I guess you're bumping into me here in my default value system, which is if I have the most beautiful business card in the whole world, won't the client think I'm trying to show off and be a shooter? And you're, you're telling me no. I think the client's hoping you are. I mean, I, I don't think any of us should, should commit a fraud. I don't think I should go and rent a Lamborghini when I want to, you know, make a credentials presentation to a prospective client. But at the same time, I don't think I'm serving anybody if I hide the fact that we're, that we're a successful business. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll try to make sure I dress well and with some little detail that's memorable. And I'll try to make sure that car is clean and, it, and I don't feel too guilty about driving something that's late model. You know, I, I, these you know, have, are having a nice briefcase. I mean, these things, however you choose to do it, and I wouldn't want anybody to sort of make a list and say, well, I got to get a $1,000 business card and a nice car and, and a better jacket. But, but, but be aware that every choice you make about, about your physical presentation um, will be assumed to be intentional. And so it may as well be intentional. You may as well think about how you want to uh, present yourself when you walk in the room because that meeting is half over before you've opened your mouth. Wow. So people are listening right now and I wonder if they're thinking what I'm thinking, which is all those years when I first started out and I wanted those luxury clients, I did the opposite of what I probably should have done to let them know I could handle their projects. Uh, by kind of playing it small, I had a nice car, I'd kind of park it down the street. I didn't want them to think like, you know, who is this fancy thing showing up here? Who is this powder puff? She can't handle my hard work. Um, And in fact, I probably should have embraced that a little bit sooner. Well, I I mean, I I didn't know you then, so I I couldn't say, but maybe. um, I mean, I think if I'm a client, and and I have been a client of of yours, I want to know that you get me. Um, and if, uh, if you, if you walk in the door sending signals of humility and, and, you know, kind of hair shirt, you know, uh, um, you know, frugality, um, and I'm a successful Bay street lawyer living in Rosedale, my, my, the first question that's going to go through my mind is, are you my people or do you even know who, or, or you know, you, you, you did our, our loft. I hope it's okay for me to, to mention that, um, you know, it's in a particular part of the city that's got a particular vibe and, and it would have been terrifying to hire somebody who, who walked in the door looking as though they had come from a completely different part of the city and didn't get the neighborhood or us at all. It would not have been confidence inspiring and you might've been the most talented person in the world, but I would have been very nervous about writing that check. Wow. I'm going to be curious uh, to hear from our listeners on this topic and see if this is resonating with them as much as it is with me and uh, how important it is for us to be aware of the fact that it's okay to own your fabulousness and playing small doesn't actually serve you very well. And um, that if you really want those luxury clients, you do have to be able to talk their language because I there's so many ta- there's so many conferences and podcasts and seminars devoted to getting luxury clients. And the fact of the matter is, I think most of them, at least the ones I've listened to, have completely missed the mark. Yeah, I mean, and it's not that I'm unsympathetic to, you know, what it takes to get a business off the ground. And again, I stress, I I wouldn't want to be taken too literally here. But I think about the times that we have worked with graphic designers, for example, and you know, we'll walk into a room and sit down with those people. And, and the, the thought that's in my mind, uh, from the moment I sit down is you had better have better taste than I do. Yeah. I'm sure our clients want to know that about us as well. Right. And you know, the thing is clients are well-traveled. They are well-read. They appreciate good food and good wine. And they want to be able to talk to you about all of those things when you go in their home to decorate. So, you, you know, you, owning that is okay. 
I, I totally, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you don't do yourself any favors by playing modest and you don't do yourself any favors by playing bland. Wow. Beige isn't a color, it's a way of life. <laughs> right. There you go. Okay, so I want to I wanna speak, I guess I'm feeling sort of uh, protective of that person who's just starting out and they think they're very far away from you, where you are and very far away from where I feel that I am. How do they portray swagger a little bit more? What are the things that they can do to be a little bit more confident, project confidence? And I think, by the way, if they project confidence, eventually they grow into that a little bit faster. Right. Well, you know, I think there are some very basic tools that um, that a designer must have to have from the moment they hang out their shingle. And uh, those tools are probably some kind of website. And they're probably some kind of logo and some basic... Um, you know, collateral material like a business card. Um, and they probably, there's probably some kind of presentation format that they have to work in when they're, um, you know, sharing their thinking with clients. Those are three areas where, um, where good graphic design, uh, will pay off. And, and so I would, you know, I, I would say that that's a place to start that doesn't need to be very expensive, um, or very soul crushing, (laughs) you know, to just go the extra mile to make them gorgeous. And, um, I think that, uh, you know, every agency art director I ever met thought he was a graphic designer and every graphic designer I ever met thought he was an architect and every ac- architect I ever met thought he was a graphic, de- you know, <laughs> we're, right. we're, we're sort of terrible about this, but, but I, I, I would say, you know, there are a lot of really brilliant, gifted and, you know, be- you know, graphic designers out there who do beautiful work and don't charge a million dollars, at least consider the possibility of having that initial body of work, um, you know, created for you, um, because a, they'll be better than you and B, they're going to think you're better than you think you are. Right. I can, I can speak firsthand to this one. I think I'm, I'm a pretty good interior designer. So how hard can a business card be? And, uh, I can choose a color for my website and I can choose a font and all that kind of stuff. And I did that for a long time. And then, you know, full disclosure, I hired heuristic, uh, I can't remember if I hired you first or you hired me first or if it was like a rock, paper, scissors thing. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I was shocked at your sort of dissection of what was going on with the business of design brand. I thought we had a pretty solid brand. I was pretty proud of what the original site looked like. And then your assessment kind of blew my mind. So I realized, like, why did I think that I knew how to do that? When I, why did I automatically assume I could do that because I'm an interior designer? I had no, I mean, I was so far out of my depth. Well, I think, you know, so that you're not, you know, too hard on yourself. I mean, I think part of it is because there's a set of skills that those people have that, you know, you may not have as in as much abundance as they do. But the other thing is that, you know, there's a reason why they say the lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. Um, you know, even if you're the best in the world, you are, you're going to suck at being your own client. You're, all your hangups are going to get wrapped up in the decisions you're making about your own brand. And if you, if you like so many creative people have, you know, have, have insecurities, if you get up every morning with imposter syndrome, if you're the kind of person who goes, oh my God, I'm not sure I'm up to this job and, and uh, you know, I'm a fraud. Geez, I hope I, you know, like these are voices that we all hear. You got a um, hold of my diary, how? <laughs> how did you well, get my diary? I feel the same way as a writer. I think we all we all have these issues. Well, that makes us terrible clients. You want somebody sitting across the table from you who who, who looks at you on the surface and, and takes their own hope uh, rather than their own hangups and says, I bet this is the best interior design that there has ever been. And so I'm going to do a logo for that person. And the, the designer who did uh, your work with us um, was entirely focused on what makes you great and 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 is unaware of your hangups if you know to the extent that they might exist <laughs> right no for sure but I that convinced me I'm ruined now I know I'm ruined you know it's kind of like when you take your own photographs of finished rooms you think they look pretty good and then you hire a professional and you go oh my god I will never take another photograph of yeah. a room I do again I will never attempt a website or a business card or a logo or the color story or the font or any of it because there's just so much to think about and getting it right matters so much. And I feel like I grew, I grew into the brand when the brand looked better. I got better when the brand looked better. 
I got better when the brand got better. And that right there, my friends, is the moment where I realized, wow, there's a whole other conversation we need to have with brand strategist Bruce Philp. And so we are going to break this up into two parts. Uh, and we're going to talk in part two about imposter syndrome a little bit more. And we'll talk also about how you can become that talented, amazing design professional by rising up and occupying the space that a great brand can build for you. Bruce has more to say on today's subject, though, and I think you're going to be particularly interested to hear how he approaches flat fee contracts. And he also shares his favorite technological aid. And I think those of us who run small businesses will appreciate this. This is one of those things that gives you the optics of being a big professional firm. Okay. I like to end every episode and you're, you were incredible. Thank you so much. I I feel like I have to go back and listen to this three times myself. I like to end every episode with some rapid fire kind of value bombs, I guess. And in your case, I'm going to ask Well, I know we have different businesses, but I'm just going to ask you anyway, do you have a favorite clause in your contract, in particular one that you think might translate into my world? Yeah, I do actually. Um, the, so in, in our business, we tend to avoid billing by the hour, um, you know, so that maybe there are some differences there. So instead what, what we will do so is, is base our quotes on day rates rather than hourly rates. Um, and, uh, and and what we'll do is scope the work that we do as specifically as we possibly can. So so we'll present um, you know here is the, here is exactly the end result you will get. Here is our work process, and here is the product you'll get at the end, and here's the price. So so it's not by the hour. It's not like running a taxi meter. It's like you're going to get this thinking from me, and it's going to cost you fifty thousand dollars and. Um, and clients really like that um, because it means that they don't have to worry about the meter running whenever they pick up the phone. And, you know, it's uh, uh, there's a little opportunity for, you know, us to make some margin by becoming more efficient. And it also takes into account the fact that I'm thinking about the problems that I'm trying to solve for them all the time, not just when I'm sitting at my desk. So that's the little sketch of how our business works. So we have a clause in the contract that says that that we will change the fee under two circumstances. One is if the scope changes and two is if the work continues beyond a a set deadline. So in other words, we'll make a date. We'll say, look, this work is going to cost you $50,000. It won't cost you a penny more. You don't have to give it another thought. Um, But if you add work, we'll charge you more. And if you drag this out, we'll charge you more. (laughs) And it's amazing how it keeps people in line. And it also happens to line up perfectly with the truth about how our business actually works financially. Okay, so this applies directly to every flat fee project we do. It's the exact same thing. We define the scope of work. We name a flat fee. And um, it won't go over. But the thing that I'm missing and the thing that I'm going to add and the thing that all of us is go- are going to add is a deadline. It has to be finished by X date or we're going to charge more. Right. That's so good. I'm experiencing a direct problem because of that right now. The client delayed, delayed, delayed. It didn't, it didn't take any more of my time for her to delay, but now I've got a pile up of projects that I shouldn't have. Right. That one should be done. Yep. But it's not done, and there's no penalty for that delay. Yep. So, wow, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, how about this one? Is there a favorite uh, tool, uh, tech tool that you use on a regular basis? I think there would be, there'd be a lot of contenders for that, um, but I, I kind of want to say our conference calling service. Um, I know that sounds bananas because it's not really all that high tech, but when you're a very small company and you work out of your home in your pajamas, there is something comforting to people about being able to say, we'll set up a conference call on our service for you, um, or being able to present a PowerPoint presentation over that thing. It just looks professional for the 300 bucks a year it costs us to have that thing and to give them access to local dial-up numbers anywhere in the world. It just, it, it goes back to the thousand dollar business card. It makes it look like we care about those details and we are professional, even though we're small. So it would be better for me to say, I'm going to set up a conference call for us through our service than to say, I will call you when I drop my son off at soccer and before I pick up the milk right. from the grocery store. Right. 
Okay, so optics matter is Absolutely. what I'm learning yeah. from you. Optics matter, and the reason they matter is they give people confidence. And they will take what they think they discovered about you, and they'll they'll apply it to everything they they believe you're doing, but but can't see. So so the the fact that we have a professional conference service that has gives them a local dial up number for San Francisco, and and it has the ability to share files and desktop, you know, that that's like okay. So they're serious. That must mean they're being serious about all the other stuff they're doing too. And and as dumb as it sounds, this is how the human mind works. Wow! And you follow that thread all the way to the end of the ball of yarn. And I bet you the client doesn't argue as much with the company that has the conference calling service uh, as it does with the woman who's exhausted and dropping her kid at soccer and picking up milk on the way home before she makes dinner. Yeah, no doubt. Wow. It's kind of like leading with the chin, isn't it? When you give out those personal details, you're setting yourself up for some judgments. Yeah, you think you're putting some forgiveness in the bank, but what you're really doing is giving away your power. What's the name of the conferencing service you use? Right. We use GoToMeeting, um, but I'm sure there are lots of equally good ones uh, out there that, that offer the same sorts of services. But GoToMeeting is good and stable, and, and um, we uh, we also use it as our um, – uh, when we're doing podcasting work, we use it as our dial-in tool. Okay. So we, we use that as well when we do webinars. We have GoToWebinar, and I think it's a s- super reliable. But I've never used it to set up calls with clients. I don't know why. That's kind of crazy. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, I think a lot of the work that you do probably is done in the client's home or office, so it's not really asking much of them. But in corporate life, um, we find that people are delighted to not have to go sit in a meeting room or get in the car. Why? Right. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Three ways small business owners give away their power. <laughs> this is your fault. You brought it up. <laughs> the next book. Really? <laughs> no, yours, not mine. My next book, no. <laughs> and we're going to talk about your books. But three ways small business owners give away their power. Um, I think that uh, I think that's one for sure. Is just the simple professional, you know, details uh, of of, the, of how you conduct business. I think um, independent professionals are terrible at cash flow, and by that I mean prompt invoicing and prompt follow up when things go uh you know over the agreed payment terms i think when you do that you 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 profess your weakness in uh, you know just unmistakable terms um and uh third one i think it goes back to this thing we talked about earlier about sort of purpose and positioning if you appear to be willing to compromise on the fundamental things about who you are as a designer, um, they know they've got you. And, uh, uh, and that, that I've certainly seen that happen in our business. Um, and it doesn't get better. How many years ago was it that, uh, Consumer Republic launched this, by the way, is a, a business, one of the business books that Bruce has written. And I remember being at your book launch yeah, that was pizza was good, right? I yes, remember the pizza. As a matter of fact. Um it came out in two thousand in the in Canada in two thousand eleven and in the States in two thousand and twelve. Is there any country it's not out in right now? Um we sold we meaning my agent and I sold worldwide worldwide rights to um to the publisher. So it was kind of up to them after that. And um as it's turned out it was in Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and I think that's it. So one of the things that I took away from that book is that the um, that being a brand means you have some skin in the game, that consumers look at a company that's a brand and there's, we talked a little bit on the show about the confidence, but there's also kind of a belief that you're in it for the long haul and that if and when there's a challenge or something goes wrong, you'll still be doing it so they can go back to you. So those are all powerful reasons why it's okay to be a brand. What else would you say off the top of your head from Consumer Republic is valuable to our group? And everybody, by the way, will have a link to the book. Uh, It's an excellent read. I know there's a great little story about a toaster, uh, (laughs) which I've shared, I'm sure, at seminars, et cetera, and Bruce shared actually at one of our conferences. But are there a couple other takeaways from Consumer Republic that we need to look for? Well, I really think that's the big one. I mean, the point that I was trying to make to consumers was that 
that if a brand is famous, um, it has a lot to lose by disappointing you. Um, and so if you spend your money with the companies whose values you share and you don't spend your money with the company whose values you don't share, and if you're willing to speak up when you're happy and when you're not, um, then by definition, you will create a more conscientious form of capitalism. You'll create better companies. Um, and you know, the world is full of, uh, increasingly full of examples of both scenarios. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, the parallel that you've drawn here is, is kind of perfect, that, that if, if you stand up and say, this is my company, this is my name, this is what I stand for, um, I am willing to be, to be a, a little bit famous, to be known by people, then the person sitting across the table from you knows whether they form the thought or not, they know instinctively that you've got something to lose by letting them down. Whereas if I was just, you know, Kevin, the branding consultant, then I might disappear tomorrow. Um, you know, my, <laughs> why should they trust me? Um, cause I'm not going to be around to share the pain if I screw up. Um, I think that the parallel is, is exactly the right one. And I don't think there's a better theme in the book with respect to the people listening to this podcast. So everybody needs to pick up a copy of Consumer Republic. And like I said, we'll have a link, uh, to it on the website. Uh, Bruce, you've got to come back. Got to promise you'll come back. Oh, okay. I promise. <laughs> you can wear your onesie. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for being a part of the business of design community. If you love what you hear on the podcast, take the next step by signing up at businessofdesign.com. As our thank you, you'll gain access to Business of Design's 15-step project management strategy, a free introductory course which includes three Business of Design systems you can implement for immediate results. And when you're ready for success, a Business of Design membership, monthly or annual, will dramatically improve your business and your life. What are you waiting for? Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today 